Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's interview with the Masters with Pete Zoppi. Uh, before we begin, I want everyone to know that there is a question module that you have where you can enter all your questions in for this session. So please make sure you use that to uh, enter your questions in. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'll pass it over to Pete so that he can give us a basic bio as far as who he is, how he entered the industry, and talk about some of the work he's done. And then from there, answer any and all questions you may have. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for t attending today's interview. And hopefully you enjoyed as much as I know I am going to. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce now Mr. Pete Zoppi. He's a senior character artist for Treyarch. And he has some of the most amazing work I've seen to date. Um, well, anyway, let's just see what he has. Pete, I'm going to pass it over to you now. All right, thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me today. Let me just uh, show my screen here. So you can see everything, we're, we're good? Yes, sir. All right, so yeah, I am a uh, senior character artist at Treyarch. Uh, I've been with Treyarch now for about uh, seven years. Um, so I'll go through a little bit of a bio, uh, a few minutes of bio about myself, how, you know, how I got started, and then... Um, I'll go through some of my work, but I also I think we can just kind of leave it open um, throughout the this discussion that we can leave it open to questions at any time, so I can kind of answer things that people are interested in knowing. Um, so, yeah, so I uh, I'm a senior character artist with Treyarch. I've been with Treyarch for uh, seven years. Uh, prior to that, I was with Activision at uh, another Activision studio called Luxo Flux, um, where I worked on a Kung Fu Panda video game. Uh, prior to the games industry, I was working in film, where I, I worked at Rhythm and Hughes and uh, at Luma Pictures. And um, at Luma, Luma was actually my first job. I worked there for about almost a year uh, on Underworld Evolution, and that was a, a really cool experience to work on a film straight out of school. Um, and I was actually going to, I went to Noman, and prior to Noman, I did an undergraduate in uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, at Trinity College, where I studied uh, studio art. So I got a an art background there, and then um, I kind of knew I wanted to get into computer graphics. So I ended up coming out to Los Angeles and going to Noman for about a year and a half, and then started uh, started working immediately after that at uh, at Luma Pictures. Um, so I, like I said, I started in film, and then um, with the sort of introduction of the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, I kind of felt like it was a good opportunity to transition from uh, doing film work to, to getting into game work. So um, it's kind of nice that I've had the experience of working on both film and, and games. The only thing I guess I haven't really done is like uh, pre-rendered cinematic work. So uh, maybe sometime in the future I'll, I'll try my hand at that. Um, so um, I'm just going to go through uh, some of the work that I've done um, over the years, and like I said, we can we can leave it open to, to questions that that pop up any time. Because um, I I do want to address anything that people are interested in instead of just kind of rambling on about uh, things that people might not be interested in. So um, I'll kind of go through some of my work in chronological order here. So uh, like I said, I started at um, at Luma Pictures on uh, on Underworld Evolution, and uh, the great thing about going to a school like uh, when I went to Noman was that uh, at the time, this was back in, I'd say, 2002, 2003, 2003 is when I started going to Gnome, and there weren't that many schools teaching uh, computer graphics, and so I made a lot of great connections there, and uh, one of my buddies actually started working at uh, Luma, and he kind of got me in over there, so I worked as a modeler and a texture artist, so, and I, I got to work on both um, environments and on um, on character stuff, so let me just go through some of the, um, some of the, let me open it in a different viewer here. And while you do that, there is a question as far as uh, a side bio question asking, did you take a specific track or individual classes at Noman back in 2003? Uh, I did their, their certificate program. So I went through, even though I had a, you know, a bit of an art background with um, drawing and photography, I focused on, in college with my undergraduate, I focused on uh, drawing and photography. Um, but I did the, decided to do the certificate program at Noman, so I would get you know, a little bit more experience with just uh, art fundamentals with perspective drawing and, and just kind of getting a taste, a taste for uh, everything that the kind of computer graphics industry has to offer instead of um, focusing on one thing immediately. It kind of allowed me to experience a lot of different things. 
And so that's what. Uh, so I did the the full certificate program there, which um, I you know I really enjoyed and thought it was a great experience for myself. So. Um, so this is um, some of the work that I did at, at Luma on Underworld. So we had to build a, a full, like, rundown uh, old um, fortress here that was covered in snow uh, for an end part of the movie. So um, this is a, just an ambient occlusion render of it uh, from the movie. So it was me and, I think, three or four other artists building all this geometry. And, uh, you know, we were basically building low-res blockout geometry, sending that over to ZBrush, and uh, doing all the, the high-frequency detail work in there. Um, so these these are a little bit dark, but you kind of um, you can kind of see some of the some of the different angles. There were probably twelve to fifteen shots of the fortress, the kind of like uh, establishing and fly around shots of it. So that was pretty cool to work on. And I'll show um, here. Uh, this is just a, a pass showing the um, the low res geometry and then the, the ambient occlusion render. So um, this was back in 2005, 2006, so um, ZBrush was still relatively new at the time, so we were kind of doing some interesting new things with it. So, um, was this all displacement kind of, detail, basically? Yeah, it was all displaced. Yeah, we, we um, rendered out um, or we built the low-res geometry, used ZBrush to detail it, and then extracted displacement maps for all of it. And then it was all, it was all displaced. So um, yeah, pretty low-res geometry and all displacement mapping. Very cool. Um, and then I also got the opportunity to work on some, to do some character work as well, um, which was in, in that in the movie it was all um, transformation sequences of uh, humans transforming into um, werewolves. So uh, what we had to do here was um, obviously this is a live action actor uh, on set. And so part of my job was to take the reference, take this plate, and make a 3D model of the, uh, of the actor that matched exactly to the, the image on the plate here so that we could, over, say, three or four frames, blend in, um, blend from the, uh, the, the live action actor to the computer-generated one, and then the transformation would start. So the, that was built, so the model was built, and then a lot of the texture work was actually projecting um, the the reference imagery from the plate onto the onto the model, so that we would get an exact one to one match of the model to the live action actor. Um, so I got to do that, and then um, there's another uh, transformation sequence here as well, which is pretty much the same technique. So again, just matching uh, the actor's face, uh, doing texture work, and then photo projecting the plate on, so we get a, an exact match, and then over a three or four frame uh, span, it would blend from the live action into the CG model. And were you responsible for so, also um, doing the textures as well, or only the models? Um, no, I was the, when I worked at Luma, we were um, yeah, we did we did models and textures. So that was kind of cool to, because I know a lot of uh, because Luma is a smaller a smaller shop. They they have uh, a lot of artists there who are pretty versatile with doing a lot of various things. So um, I know at a lot a lot of larger uh, visual effects studios, you know, there's a mo specifically a modeling department. Like when I worked at um, Rhythm and Hughes, I was just on the modeling department, and then there was an, actually another department which was just um, texture painters. Okay. Uh, but the cool thing about Luma was I got experience doing both modeling and texture work. Um, and then from there, so that after uh, working at, um, on, uh, at uh, Luma for a bit, I ended up going over to uh, Rhythm and Hughes to work on um, Night at the Museum. Um, so I built a, a variety of things on that, but one of the cool things I got to do was a uh, this mammoth head. So we built a computer-generated mammoth, and then I got to do the, uh, the ZBrush sculpting. And that, again, was still at a pretty early phase of when ZBrush was be starting to become popular. And um, they hadn't, at that time, this was 2006, I think, uh, they hadn't really integrated ZBrush into their, into their pipeline because they weren't quite sure where that fit in because it was kind of a, a crossover between modeling and texturing because typically the texture painters would do all of the bump map painting and the displacement mapping. And so they were kind of unsure where to, where to fit it into the pipeline. So um, it was kind of cool to be there at a time when when that was becoming popular and we kind of started having the, the modeling team do all of the, the ZBrush work. So, and I have a kind of a turntable here that was done in, in ZBrush of it. Um, so that was kind of cool to get to work on that. And I worked on uh, a variety of other things there, some animals and uh, uh, just some of the, the 
small miniature characters. If anyone's seen the movie, there's these miniature characters that kind of run around. So we got to we had to build a lot of these miniature human characters. So and all all that was from from reference. They gave us supplied us with a lot of um, a lot of uh, photography reference and that sort of thing. So that was a, a pretty cool experience to work um, at a larger film studio to see how how that process works as well. Um, so. So I worked there. The, the one thing that that uh, I really enjoyed working at Rhythm and Hughes. The one problem was that um, I was originally signed with a uh, like a six month contract, and I'd say like four months into that, they said they were going to start letting people go early because they didn't have the work coming in. And then, and so I was like, oh, I'm going to find new work. And then it. Um, then they said, oh no, we got some new work in, so we're going to want you for another four or five months. So then I was staying there, and then. Uh, you know, a few months into that new four or five months, it was like, oh, we're going to start cutting people loose. So it was kind of a weird situation to be in where um, things were kind of always up in the air with regards to my, my work schedule. It was like, oh, am I going to be working in five months or am I not? So I kind of took the uh, initiative to start looking for, um, to get into the game industry. So um, I ended up going to uh, Luxo Flux, and I thought it would be kind of interesting. They were working on uh, the Kung Fu Panda video game, which was launching with um, with the original movie when it came out. And so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to do some different style work because up to that point, I had done all realistic stuff with Underworld and and working at Rhythm and Hues. And so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to do some more um, some more stylized work. So let me just bring up um, some of the stuff that I got to do at. Uh, at Luxo Flux, so we worked um, relatively close with um, with DreamWorks, who were making the movie, and so we would get assets from them. But then it was part of my job to um, take the the assets that they had and kind of get them prepped and ready for our engine, and then um, do all the all of the texture work. So it was a fair amount of modeling work, but more so um, more texturing work. So I got to work on um, a lot of the hero characters from the movie. Um, as well as this kind of big juggernaut uh, character that uh, some of the characters have to battle during it. Right. Um, and the cool thing about working at Luxo was that there were it was me and one other character artist, so it was kind of nice to uh, work on a on a small just with a small group of, of people, just me and him and and um, a couple concept artists. So. And did you actually have the physical models from DreamWorks to work from, or just photographic references of it? Uh, no, we actually would get um, we would get the the physical uh, 3D models from them. Um, but depending on what our uses were for it, we would have to either you know resurface it or change topology or or figure out ways to get it to work within within our engine. But um, part of that was you know obviously with managing, um, which was one of the things that I've found a lot from having worked in production is that there's obviously has to be a lot of brand management, and so part of that is you know. Uh, managing that Kung Fu Panda brand is really about making the assets and things look the same across the board. So there's not really a point in not giving us that information. It's like if you want the the characters to look the same in the movie and the game, you know, it's you're best off sharing those assets across multiple companies or multiple studios. So I just remember um, yeah, it didn't really make time. sense for us to, you know, either get a photo or just. Yeah, it's, it, it didn't make sense for time, and it just didn't make sense in terms, of, like I said, for brand management, making sure that that everything is the same across the board. So that's right. why we would get assets. But then, for for certain game specific areas, um, you know, there were characters that we had to sort of design on the fly that would sort of fit in with um, with the look and feel of that of that world. So we had concept artists who would come up with some um, some of that stuff. So it was a mix of of kind of making some things up, but for the most part working off a lot of what we would get from uh, from DreamWorks. Um, so after, let me think, after Luxo Flux, I ended up, um, I, while I enjoyed doing some of the stylized stuff, I actually found that, that I did prefer to do more realistic stuff. So I ended up um, referring a friend into Treyarch as a character artist and then they actually needed more character artists for a uh, James Bond video game so I ended up transferring within the Activision company from uh, Luxo Flux to Treyarch and I started working there on the uh, on James Bond the Quantum of Solace game um, and then uh, from there because one of the things that I that I enjoyed playing and sort of knew that I wanted to do at some point was was work on like a military shooter and I knew that Treyarch at the time was 
working on multiple projects. So they would have, at the time that I started there, uh, James Bond was going and Call of Duty World at War was going. Um, and so after the Bond game finished, the whole studio got consolidated into, um, into one large art team that just was working on Call of Duty. So I got the opportunity to work on um, the first Call of Duty Black Ops game. So um, let me bring up some of the, some of the stuff that, uh, that I did on that game. Um, so I got to work on, uh, there were, it was me and I think there was seven or eight other character artists working on it. Um, so uh, we got to build, you know, all the characters for the game and, and this was pretty interesting because it was, uh, we would get, because it was histor had to be historically accurate in terms of the, because Black Ops pretty much takes place during the Cold War. Uh, we had military advisors that would give us uh, reference imagery of, Different um, different armies, different soldiers, different factions. So I'll just start uh, going through. Actually, that's from Black Ops 2. Let me get um, let me go into this one here. So uh, so we had to do. A, it was kind of interesting because we had to do a lot of research, and so we were building. Um, this is some uh, some of the NVA characters from the Vietnam era. So we got to build NVA characters. So we w we actually had. Um, military advisors that would advise us on this stuff, and then we also had some um, some soldiers from that era. We had some, some Vietnam uh, Vietnam uh, special ops war vet come in and kind of give us a talk, and then we also had a um, a Russian uh, Spetsnaz uh, soldier come in and give us a talk as well. So we kind of got um, a variety of 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 information from from various different sources on what that era was like. So, um, and then I, I actually ended up working on Black Ops 2, so all of these images are kind of um, thrown in here together, so I'll just go through um, all of them. Um, so here we have, this is, so we did NBA and then we did uh, Viet Cong characters, and this was all based on uh, reference photography and, and, and real world reference. Um, it's another NBA character, or I'm sorry, VC uh, for Viet Cong. Um, Black Ops 2 actually uh, afforded us the opportunity to, because it, some of it took place in the, in the future, um, it afforded us the opportunity to kind of um, do a little bit of design work of our own. So the character in the background here, the Secret Service character, um, was one of the characters that I built. And so because this was kind of futuristic, we got to uh, have concept artists and we got to do a little bit more design work as opposed to sticking uh, directly to uh, reference imagery. Um, this image here is from um, some of the downloadable content that we did for um, for Black Ops 2. Um, so we have with call with the Call of Duty games, we make a Treyarch. One of our cooperative game modes that comes with the game is a zombies uh, four-player zombie survival mode, uh, which is actually pretty fun because we'll, we'll kind of it's a nice change of pace to go from doing you know realistic uh, military characters to then having the the ability to kind of do character work or you know stuff that's a little outside of what we would normally get to do. So uh, this map uh, was from the um, it was called Origins, and so I got to do this um, this kind of boss uh, mech zombie that takes place in like uh, the World War One era, World War One between World War One and World War Two. So we got to do some cool uh, design work on this. I have a question uh, again, uh, about yeah. the. Um... Actually, let me just go back to my module here. So concerning the futuristic designs, the question is, did you reflect on historical designs for the future designs, and how, and in what ways did you do that? Yeah, so we, we look at, um, yeah, we, we do take into account some of the historical stuff, but then we, the way we sort of were working to design for the future was the sort of notion that we wanted to keep everything uh, looking uh, realistic. So. What we would do is let me find something here that uh, so this this guy was it, this looks kind of modern. Um, the multiplayer was was taking place in like the modern era, um, so uh, we we got to design a little bit. What what we would do is we would take current modern tech and and figure out sort of or think about how that would be used in the future. So for example, um, a good a, a good. Uh, uh, idea of that is that one of the weapons that we made for the for the game was uh, it had like a sort of a sonar pulse scanner so it was sort of taking in uh, current technology that's in a much larger form factor so if you think about the way you get scanned at an airport when you go through some of these new new age scanners it's this you know large device and then we thought well 
in the future, what we're seeing is things are, are obviously getting smaller and smaller. I mean, if you went back, say, 15 years and said, oh, you'd have a really high quality, you know, 10 or 12 megapixel camera with your phone, most people would be like, well, you know, that seems a little outrageous. But so we're seeing that, that things are, technology and things are getting smaller and smaller. So what we were trying to do was basically take current tech now that would be cool to have, but obviously is not, you know, available to most people just because of the size of it. So things like that was, was the way we were kind of um, sort of going from modern day to uh, futuristic was kind of looking at modern day tech and then figuring out, you know, 10, 12, 15 years from now, how would that be scaled down or, or, or become more portable? And so that's what kind are, of how we address that stuff. And what are some of the poly counts for these hero characters in Black Ops? Uh, Black Ops, so we actually, it's interesting because we actually don't, the way our engine works um, is that it's not specific to, it's not an exact poly count. The way our engine calculates stuff is based on, uh, it's, a, it's a vertex count. And vertex, um, vertex count is a little bit more complicated than just saying, um, you know, quads or tries uh, because verts, depending on how your UVs are broken up, if you have a UV split, that counts as extra verts. Um, hard edges compared to soft edges on your model count as extra verts. So um, I'd say, I mean, I could, I could say that our, our characters were, you know, anywhere from 18 to 20,000 verts, but that doesn't necessarily mean all that much. I'd say poly count wise, if you just looked at raw poly count, we were trying to keep for Black Ops 2, um, like a character like this would be a multiplayer character would be anywhere from, I'd say, 8 to 12,000, uh, 8 to 12,000 quads. Um, and then uh, hero characters were... Um, we're a little bit higher if, you know, a hero character might be anywhere from 15 to maybe even 20. Um, but it's a little hard for me to say exactly because my, my mind has been the way we work is verts. And so I'm, I'm constantly thinking about verts and not necessarily just straight up polygons. So it's a little hard to say exact numbers because my mind is a little bit more, it's been drilled into us that we're looking more at vert counts as opposed to, um, to straight up just poly counts. Right. Okay. Um, so, and actually, go, I have a question here: Is yeah, what kind of deadlines did you have on the characters in Black Ops? Um, we would usually get well. It depends. So let me let me actually show um, this because this will actually help uh, make maybe make a little more sense with how we kind of work on certain things. So this is a shot from uh, from the like a, a shot from multiplayer. So. Um, I actually worked, this is from the original Black Ops, so I worked on uh, this character right here in the foreground. Now, what we do for, specifically for multiplayer, if I show you, say, this image here, um, this is, what we do is that the characters for multiplayer are broken down into these, um, into these factions. So uh, a faction is essentially five characters, and the way we were doing the look of the character was if you picked... Um, the look of your character was based based upon the um, the ability that you picked um, for your character. So uh, this first character here was the, the lightweight character, so he could move faster. Um, this guy here um, was heavily armored, so he was a little bit bigger and had a, he moved a little bit slower, but he was more armored. Then we have our sniper here, which is um, kind of like more camouflage in a, in a ghillie suit. So when we design characters, we're not just thinking about one character specifically, it's, it's all, almost all the time we're thinking about the look of all the characters across a faction. So we would typically build the entire faction, so it's not just one character at a time. And what we, what we tend to do is share as much as we can across the characters while also giving them um, the look of having a, a variety of gear. So if you kind of look closely at this, you'll see that uh, these two guys are actually wearing the same hat. This one is spun around backwards. These two are wearing the same pants. Um, actually, three guys are wearing the same pants. This guy has a unique pair of pants. Um, we're sharing holsters. We're sharing um, we're sharing uh, ammo pouches. So we we try to share as many things as possible and figure out how to make variety out of that. So the first step that we usually do is we look at the concept and then we we break things down and we say, okay, well we can make um, two lower bodies. Um, maybe three or four upper bodies, and then we can share vests or that sort of thing. So I'd say a full character faction might take 
um, because there is shared assets, um, a character faction could take six to eight weeks to put a full faction together. Um, and I'd say if it was if it was one unique character, that might be three weeks to do one unique character that doesn't really share anything. Um, so that's kind of what our our time frames are. But for the most part, we share. Um, you know, if you really actually do look closely, we share as much stuff as we possibly can without making them look too similar, and we try to get um, unique looks. And a lot of that does come down to performance too. Our game does run at uh, 60 frames a second, so we're always kind of um, in terms of poly counts and vert counts, we, we've tended to be a little bit on the lower side, so we actually can run the game at 60 frames per second. And are these um, typically all modeled in Maya and ZBrush, or one or the other? Like, what, what is the most, uh, what, yeah, what, so, what software do you use the most for these? Um, Maya, so what we do is, um, to make sure everything works, we will pretty much build and block everything out in Maya and do our UV layout in Maya and make sure we have sort of before moving on to any sort of high poly modeling, we, we really try to lock down um, which parts are going to be, uh, which, you know, which gear we actually have to make, and we'll do our UV layouts and make sure that everything kind of fits together before we commit to doing any, um, before we commit to doing any sort of high poly, uh, any high poly modeling. We really have to make sure that everything sort of fits together and works together, and then we'll send stuff over to, um, to ZBrush or, or Mudbox. Um, and the way we typically work is that, um, so I'll just keep kind of going through these. Um, yeah, so the way we typically work is the, the, the character is essentially assembled with all of his basic parts in Maya. And then what most of our artists do, uh, including myself, is we'll kind of, uh, and then we UV layout everything, and, and then we'll sort of send pieces out one by one and sort of detail them and extract normal maps and, and put them together that way. So there's not usually a scenario, because of the amount of shared stuff, there's not usually a scenario where we have a full, completely done, high-poly character in ZBrush. Pretty much everything is pieced together in Maya and then sent out to ZBrush or Mudbox to do all of the, uh, all the detail work. And do you find that your deadlines are stressful or are they easy to work with? Um, it depends. Sometimes, I mean, we, when we do get down to uh, the part at which, you know, we do have these milestones that we have to hit, like if we have to hit a, a beta milestone where, you know, we need a, two factions of characters and um, they have to be fully completed, that stuff gets a little bit, uh, a little bit more on the stressful side just because it's, there are these hard deadlines that we have to hit, but um, if we're just kind of working through uh, through the project, some of the deadlines aren't aren't terrible. But um, usually, you know, by the end of the project, um, the last few months um, it really just depends on the project. But the last few months is usually uh, a substantial amount of work because that's when a lot of the tech really does finally come online. Everything is starting to get pieced together. Um, and then we'll start iterating on things and making tweaks once everything starts to come online. Okay. Um, so that's some of the. Let me just go through all these, uh, all these as well. Let me just open this in the slideshow viewer. And why? Um, so this was from Black Ops One. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say while you're doing that, I was going to ask a question concerning from sure. earlier. Someone asked, uh, "Do you have any tips on what to present in your portfolio to having a better chance of getting a job as a character artist in the game industry?" Um. Well, I guess it really depends on what you're interested in or what you find your skill set to be more tailored to because there are, uh, you know, a variety of, of different games. I mean, you could, you know, potentially a character artist who has worked on, you know, who only has experience doing all stylized stuff, um, you know, more along the lines of, say, something like a DreamWorks uh game or a, a movie, something like that, I mean, maybe your skill set is more tailored towards that, um, or you need to work more towards uh, realism. So I'd say you either have to kind of decide what what it is you want to kind of go for. Um, in terms of portfolio, um, I mean, anything that, you know, if you were going for something more realistic, more along the lines of, say, like a Call of Duty or, um, you know, any of these kind of modern uh, realistic shooters, uh, that type of stuff, you're probably going to want to obviously make more realistic stuff, putting together, you know, a, a full, fully polished, uh, fully polished character. Um, 
You know, and I think if you really compare yourself uh, to, you know, the work that's currently being done or the work that's out there, you really kind of need to be honest with yourself and, and look at how you sort of stack up against the people that are actually doing this work because that's kind of, you know, when you apply for a job, for the most part, they want to be able to plug someone into the pipeline that, that can kind of just automatically get up and running and is already there with all of the with all the artistic side, and really at that point you're just going to get plugged into a production and just learn some of the tech stuff and how things are kind of done at the studio. So um, I think you know to to kind of make you know to make your chances a little bit better. I mean, having three or four a variety of characters, you know, a couple, three, maybe two, three realistic things, and then maybe one stylized thing. But I'd say full characters are definitely a good thing to show. Um, also, you know, maybe just do a, a really nice. Um, realistic head, you know, just kind of show you can do uh, proper anatomy and, and that sort of thing. So, but again, I, I think there's not really one clear-cut answer as to, you know, what should you have in your portfolio. I think, you know, if your work is good, you'll, you'll get noticed and, and um, you know, you will get noticed and you can, you can get jobs that way. Um, so, okay. Let me see, uh, so I'll, I, I can, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, no, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll kind of go through some of my uh, let me see I'll go through some of my personal projects here that I've kind of done over the years and this is kind of like you know if you were putting a, a portfolio together this might be you know kind of some of the stuff that you you might want to include obviously because you're if you're if you don't have work experience um, you're obviously going to be all you know have all sort of personal projects so it's just a variety of um, of stuff that usually in my in my free time if I'm doing personal projects I tend to um, work because I do game related stuff obviously at work all the time. If I'm doing personal projects at home, I tend to do um, more rendered stuff, uh, more higher poly instead of doing low poly work. So most of the work here is high poly stuff that's uh, rendered in uh, in Mental Ray for Maya. Um, so, and then here are just some breakdowns. So um, the one thing I've, just part of my workflow as well that I've sort of found uh, is pretty beneficial is that um, Try, trying to harness uh, as much of the tech as possible that's available to you. So, you know, in order to get all of these scales on here, for example, on this character, um, in order to really accurately sculpt all this stuff in, and, you know, I might need to subdivide this up to, I mean, I don't even know, 40, 50, 60 million polygons if I really want to keep this tight. So one of the things that I typically do is sculpt up to a, a manageable level where the poly count isn't so high that it just becomes hard to manage that amount of data because that's one of the things that once things kind of, if I get slowed down or bogged down, it starts to become kind of frustrating. So I, I try to keep my working speed up. Um, so what I'll typically do for something like this is is sculpt up as much as I can and then I'll actually switch over to, to in, in Mudbox specifically, I'll, I'll do uh, real-time bump map painting. Um, there's actually a lot you can get out of a, a really tight, nicely painted bump map. So most of this detail on here um, is is a lot of uh, just straight up bump map painting. So I try to do that kind of stuff where I figure out exactly what I need or you know what needs to be put in the sculpt, what actually breaks the silhouette and what needs to be there, and then all of the really high frequency stuff that would just be kind of unmanageable to do in the in the sculpt I'll do with a uh, with a bump map, and that's actually for me it's actually much faster to work that way. Um, so here's just some some various breakdowns of this character, and um, I also find it interesting to see uh, you know work in progress images because sometimes it can be a little bit deceiving to see um, you know you see a finished piece and it's like you know how did that person get there? You think you sort of think that they kind of bang that out and and got there in one sort of linear start to finish fashion, but um, this is kind of early on while I'm uh, I'm testing things. I I usually don't uh, go from start to finish in one linear way. It's kind of like I'll do some sculpting, um, start doing some test renders, go back, uh, start resculpting things, and it's a lot of back and forth. So. Um, and I just kind of keep iterating on things and, and looking at renders and dialing things in further. So you can see this is a much earlier version. Um, the shader's not all that great. Uh, the lighting is, I was kind of happy with some of the lighting, but um, you know, a lot of the texture work wasn't there. So for me, a lot of it is you know, taking a few steps forward, then stepping back a couple of steps, and then continuing to move forward in that direction. So I'm actually, uh, one of the things I'll show in a minute is um, I'm 
currently working on a class for the uh, CG Master Academy. I'm doing a character creation class. And so that's been a little bit, um, it's, it's quite a process to put a class together because by nature uh, a class sort of needs to be uh, presented in a linear start to finish fashion. Um, but the way I kind of work is it's anything but that. There is a really a lot of, again, going a few steps forward and, if, and then taking a few steps back and kind of iterating on things. So I'm still kind of um, trying to figure out the best ways to kind of present things in that linear fashion so that it makes sense while also um, continuing to work the way that I work. So uh, this is a uh, Frankenstein character that I worked on recently. Um, Here's some uh, just the, the raw kind of shaded, uh, gray shaded character. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I sculpted all this. I uh, built this in mud by, in Maya. I built a base mesh in, uh, in Maya. I posed it in Maya and then um, sent that out to Mudbox for all of the, the sculpting and, uh, and texture painting. Do you have a preference uh, when it concerns Mudbox versus ZBrush, or is it specific to the, the task that you're trying to do? Uh, usually specific to the task for organic stuff, I prefer uh, I prefer Mudbox. I, it's just a personal preference. I just prefer the the way the brushes feel. I know it doesn't have as many as many brushes and as many features in terms of brushes, but for organic sculpting, um, that isn't as much of a concern to me uh, in terms of what all the brushes can do. I can do uh, pretty much everything I need to in Mudbox. Uh, if I get to um, some of the hard surface stuff I'll do a little bit in, in ZBrush, but typically uh, the way we sort of work in production as well is most of our hard surface modeling is, is done in Maya. Um, and then we'll send stuff out to ZBrush or Mudbox for, for like a detail pass or for um, tightening things up. But uh, for the most part, I, I'd say the majority of my work is sculpted in, in Mudbox. Um, and I'll use ZBrush occasionally if there's certain things in there like uh, radial symmetry to do things like that. Um, there's certain features that, or if I'm experimenting with something, if I want to use Dynamesh or something like that, I'll I'll, I'll do stuff in ZBrush. Um, but for sort of production level organic sculpting, I I typically use um, I use Mudbox. Um, and so then this is from a character that I made a few years back. I actually did a presentation on this um, at the Evolve conference down in Florida. I think that was probably three or four years ago now. Um, and so here's just some early on test renders uh, while I'm sort of uh, testing things out, uh, just testing skin shader and uh, skin textures, that sort of thing. Um, let me go back. This, this was, um, and a lot of times when I do my test renders, um, I usually try to test individual things at a time. So this was really just to test out my um, reflection and my bump map to make sure that that was uh, reading properly before kind of combining it up with uh, the skin shader, I, I sort of find that if I do a whole bunch of work, uh, you know, do the color map, do the bump map, uh, do a gloss map, and then just like throw it all in at once, it can be a little bit hard to uh, sort of troubleshoot and figure out what it is that's potentially going wrong. So what I'll typically do is build things up um, in, in small pieces. So I'll get the, the base skin shader set up, and then I'll start plugging in one map at a time, seeing exactly how it affects the, the overall character, and then I'll con continue to work from there. Um, so yeah, I don't typically like to just kind of throw everything at once and just see what pops out and then try to troubleshoot from there. I like to control things as much as possible from the, from the start. So this was a, a final um, posed image of the character that I kind of found a background image to composite in, and then I um, built a bunch of uh, foliage in the front and kind of composited him in here. That's very awesome work. I remember this from a few years ago as well. Uh, I have a couple questions here in regards sure. to um, uh, just the, the process, not the process, but as far as your uh, experience working in, 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 in production environments. And yep. The first one is concerned with, uh, have you ever had your heart broken because you had a great design, but you couldn't make it work? Uh, um, I'd say that happens on a weekly to monthly basis. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the time. I mean, we do, there's, there's so much work that, that we do or we try to do, and it just it, it doesn't quite fit in with, um, with what it is we're working on. Or, and, and a lot of times it's, it's completely out of, out of my control, um, you know, working, 
on a franchise, I mean, might be different at a smaller studio where it's a much smaller team. But when you talk about, you know, these extremely profitable profitable brands, um, specifically Call of Duty, or you know, if you were working on a you know some profitable high end movie like Harry Potter movies or Lord of the Rings or something like that, I mean, there are people at the top who are who are making all the decisions and calling all the shots. So regardless of you know whether or not you think your thing is is completely awesome and maybe you know 90% of the people agree with you but ultimately it does come down to um, the, the few people who are actually in charge at the top so that happens a lot and I mean that's it's a difficult thing I feel like as you know artists working in the in the industry that it, that that can be a pretty difficult thing to come to grips with because I mean you do want to remain passionate about what it is you're working on and and experiment with things and come up with ideas but again working in production is is there are people who are who are making these decisions and a lot of times that stuff is completely out of your control so it's just kind of learning to uh, and even after having this much ex, you know experience working in the industry there's still those times where it's like you, you, you can get really bummed out that your stuff doesn't get used or it, or maybe it does get used but it gets you know handed off to a different artist who do some different work on. I mean, that stuff happens all the time, and it, it, it can be difficult to kind of separate yourself from that and just say, okay, I'm here to do the work. But um, yeah, it does happen all the time. So it's um, yeah, it's something I've kind of had to get used to. <laughs> right. And I guess the, the other question that was basically, I think you already answered it, uh, is uh, are these artworks heavily directed, or do you work them up to a quality yourself, and then they get accepted fairly fast? Like, how does that process typically work? Uh, with regards to like production work, I'm assuming this was question was asked a little bit earlier, so I think it was about the Call of Duty stuff. But I guess you can apply oh, okay. it to something broader as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we um, we kind of have a few different levels that that work sort of goes through. So um, we'll get some you know we'll get some design work or reference images or concept art or anything like that, and then. Um, you know, amongst the character team, we will start building things. And once we're at a point where we're happy with what we have, or we've, you know, sort of executed on what the design is, then at that point we'll start to move it up the chain and start to show it to art directors and creative directors and that sort of thing. And then right. from there, they may come back with um, with different levels of feedback. But we usually um, try to make sure that internally that things are to a point that we're happy with before. Um, before showing it to anyone, it, you can kind of run into these issues occasionally where you kind of have to pick the right time to show things. Um, if you show things too early, you can kind of start to get notes on things that you haven't addressed yet because it could potentially come later on in that in that pipeline. So we try to get things to a point that that we're happy with and we feel like we've addressed everything that needs to be addressed, and then we'll start to move it up the chain, and then we'll start to get feedback on that, and then we'll have to make um, some, make some changes. Okay. So the next question um, here is: uh, Do yeah. you tend to do uh, or make two D sketches before sculpting? No, I typically don't. I actually find it's kind of funny because um, I did do, uh, like I said, in my undergraduate. I did focus on drawing and photography, and I never f really felt like I I was really really good with with drawing. And so that was actually one of the things that kind of worried me a little bit when I was deciding to get into 3D because everything I had seen in red was like, oh, you know, you really need to focus on your drawing. And it is a valid um, point to bring up. However, for some, like, and this, this with me and, and other people I know, my brain just works much better in 3D. Um, and so if I can get my hands on clay or start sculpting something uh, in 3D, I find I don't really need to, the, the sketching portion just kind of, I feel like it just kind of slows me down, and I'd rather just get um, right into 3D and start figuring things out there. So, um, and I honestly, it's been years. I mean, I, I really don't even remember the last time I really, really did any 2D drawing or sketching. I, like I said, my brain is just much better in 3D, so I kind of <laughs> stick to that to that area. Right. Um, okay. So this this image here was from the I think it was 2006. A Blizzard had an art contest that I submitted this to, and I ended up winning the grand prize for the cinematic category. Um, so I uh, built this character, posed it, built the uh, the foreground rocks, and then the, the background was mostly, which I'd never really attempted before, was kind of a, my attempt at a, at a matte painting, which 
at the time I thought it was pretty good in hindsight looking at it. I haven't looked at this in a long time. There's certainly some things I would do differently now, but um, uh, I find you know, all this stuff is, is a pretty good, uh, pretty good learning experience. So um, this is just the, the gray shade. So you can see what was actually 3D, um, which is just all this stuff here. And then uh, you know, everything else in the background was, was sort of matte painted in. Uh, and then this is just a wireframe of, of the scene. So mostly, um, with a lot of the stuff, personal stuff I do, I actually, uh, this would be my base mesh here, and then I would typically just render, once it's posed and everything, I'll just kind of render the high-res version instead of dealing with displacement maps or that sort of thing. I'll just bring the high-res model into Maya and just render it that way. Uh, this was while I was kind of designing and coming up with some of the, the armor and pieces. Uh, this was the the wireframe of the of the body. Oh, that's one thing um, I think I probably did forget to mention earlier. This was this kind of reminded me of is you know uh, in terms of what should be shown in a portfolio if you're trying to get a job. So uh, one thing is definitely show um, you know if you don't have uh, production game experience, definitely show wireframes because we've sort of seen um, now that. 3D has become a lot more accessible to a lot more people, and, and you can kind of just get into Mudbox or ZBrush and sculpt to you know do whatever you want and create a cool looking character. Um, we have sort of seen where we've seen people who can do that kind of work, but then they're kind of lost when it comes to an actual production 3D uh, pipeline in terms of doing wireframes and making assets production ready. So um, definitely study uh, topology because it. The job is not just about uh, not just about the art of it. I mean, sure, we want to get uh, you know we want to work with great artists and have uh, talented people around. But you know, if you can't really do work in Maya or know your way around Maya for setting up shaders and exporting things and just how to manage that data and get it through a pipeline, um, you know, you're not going to be very valuable in a in a production environment. So definitely focus on while the, the art stuff is certainly important, you do need to focus on the um, the sort of stuff, the the technical things in the background, wireframes, and just general knowledge of of Maya and that sort of stuff. Actually, not to interrupt you too much, but no, go ahead. there's a question here from an illustrating, or I should say, illustration intern at an ad agency, who wants okay. to know. Um, Basically, in, in terms of getting hired, uh, his question is, you know, does he need to show a great all-around understanding of anatomy to, uh, and great lighting skills? And if so, do you have any suggestions or resources uh, he, they could use, um, whether it be books, online tutorials, or classes? Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, if, if you want to get into character, I, I, you know, anatomy is obviously a extremely important um, part of that. So I mean, maybe that, that would probably be one of the good things to, to have in a portfolio is something um, along the lines of just uh, you know, a human anatomy study where you do show the, the I mean, you could pose it, but even if it was kind of in a T-pose, but you really nail all that anatomy and then you show a wireframe of it, I mean, that alone goes a long way to showing that you, you know your anatomy um, and your, your technical stuff. In terms of lighting, the nice thing now is that, um, I mean, the, so a lot of the lighting stuff has become so much more accessible. Um, I mean, even if you want to just throw something in, like, um, with real-time stuff, you put something in Marmoset tool bag, too, and, I mean, you don't really have to do anything to light it, and you get some nice, nice-looking results. I mean, there obviously is a certain level of, of quality you can get if you start tweaking things, but it's just straight out of the box compared to the way it used to be, say, 10 years ago. I mean, the lighting is a lot more accessible now and you don't necessarily have to tinker with that stuff as much now. So in terms of yeah, getting a job, I think um, certainly showing uh, anatomy is, is an important thing. Um, you know, we'll sometimes see portfolios of people who, you know, they'll make some, like a really, really complex, cool looking character. Um, but then when you start to look a little bit closer at it, you're like, oh wait, you know, the anatomy actually looks cool because it's super complex and there's a lot of things to look at, but, but um, sometimes the actual underlying structure, the underlying proportions and forms aren't quite there when you, when you look at it from a, uh, from a closer view. So actually I do think that would be something that would be beneficial to have in a portfolio is, is something more uh, anatomical you know, along the lines of this um, realistic anatomy. Um, so like 
so just speaking of Marmoset Toolbag too, I mean this is an asset that I'm creating for part of the uh, the the 3D character creation class that I'm going to be doing for the for CGMA. So um, and this, you know, just with the even without textures, if I just threw this into Marmoset here, I mean lighting in there is like it takes like a minute, and you have some pretty cool lighting, um, and from a, a lot of different varieties, you just pick a different HDRI, and you have different lighting setups. So um, I'd highly recommend that. Um, but so this is I'll let me just keep going through here. This is another uh, character that I did. This is six, seven, eight years ago. I don't remember. It was a I kind of wanted to do a a little bit of a likeness study of a uh, this William Seward, who was the Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln. So I wanted to do a um, daguerreotype um, image that they kind of use the cameras that they kind of use to shoot uh, images back in that in that time period. So I want to do kind of a black and white study of that sort of thing. The other thing I think, um, which someone actually mentioned to me, and I didn't really think about it until uh, until he mentioned it to me, was that what I typically like to do uh, with almost, and I notice I do it with almost all my work, is not just showing um, a character just like with a with a gray background there's there's some level of integration into what that character is about so you know if we kind of go and look at um, this for example I mean yeah sure it's a character but it, it's also kind of telling some sort of story as to the era that it was that it was taken and so instead of just showing this on a, on a black background is kind of picking that you know picking apart what you know what is it about those images from that time period that made them look that way um, so obviously the black and white, but the you know the film stock at that time, it, the film just w wasn't to the quality and the lenses and that sort of thing. So um, I think with almost all my work is just even if, if the background is super simple like this, I mean, it's sort of telling some sort of story that this is um, some sort of you know like a tribal character. Um, again with the Frankenstein here, just adding some level of interest to your background. It doesn't have to be super super complex, but just something that that sort of helps to tell the story about. Um, you know what's what's actually going on here. Um, so let me go to. Um, so this is some of the images that I'm that I've been putting together. This is kind of work in progress stuff for the uh, character creation class that I'm going to be doing for uh, CGMA. So it's going to be because my background in the past seven eight years has been all military related Call of Duty. I'm going to be doing a military uh, character, modern military character for uh, for that class. We're going to be going from um, start to finish on, on building this character for kind of a game uh, game resolution pipeline. So doing high poly, low poly modeling. And then it's also going to cover uh, doing some of this anatomy stuff, you know, uh, head sculpting, um, texturing. So this will kind of run through the entire process. And this, this these renders are all from Marmoset as well. So it's going to be focused. It's not going to be any um, mental ray or V-ray or anything like that. It's going to be all real-time related. So um, there's just a couple images of, of what I've been kind of up to with that. So obviously there's a lot of stuff that's because his work in progress is incomplete. So the head is almost done, but um, I have the body pretty much uh, posed and blocked out to a certain level. And from the point I'm at now is I'm going to be working on uh, finalizing the pose and starting to do all the high poly stuff and uh, and then starting to do texture maps and that sort of thing. So that's kind of currently where I am with this course. Awesome. So I think that kind of covers most of the images that I have here. I have a few questions for you. Sure. Uh, so um, give me a second here to... Oh, actually, well, yeah, while you're coming up with that, I'll just show, show one other thing. So I've actually found these on my hard drive the other day. Um, and they're actually, they're a little bit interesting because I think I made these back in like... I don't know, 2000 when I was trying to learn uh, computer graphics. So um, I just find, I, I look at them and I, I find them kind of interesting just because of the, the kind of distance that I've sort of traveled over the years that kind of these were sort of some of my first initial kind of experiments with doing 3D without knowing that I wanted to do characters or, you know, I didn't even know what I wanted to do. It was just a matter of experimenting with stuff. So, I mean, they're, pretty crude by today's standards. They're pretty funny though. I, I found it kind of interesting like, you know, just doing kind of, I just thought it was super cool to do volumetric light and, and that sort of thing. This was one of my first attempts at <laughs> at doing a character based on following some tutorial. So um, <laughs> I think it's kind of, I, I wanted to show them because I think it's kind of interesting to sort of show that progression of stuff that it's not just you can kind of do this stuff or you can't. There's just, it's just a, 
it's really a, a, a very long uh, learning process. So that's a great I example. I found that kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, I found it kind of funny. I found them on my hard drive. I was like, oh my god, these are from like <laughs> 15 years ago. I don't even. It's just kind of funny. So I figured I'd show them because it's kind of interesting. Kind of show different uh, kind of stuff that I've done. <laughs> I, I so you think said you had some, should... some more questions. Yeah, before we get to those, I think you should put those on our site. That that's some great stuff. Um, <laughs> I have some other one. I have some other ones. I'll, I'll have to dig up. Yeah, so students funny. can actually see the progression over time. That you know, masters are made through through trial and error, not just perfection out the gate. You know, kind of thing. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's uh, yeah it's it's a lot of it is a lot of work. It's not right. there's no real quick easy way to get there. Okay, so my next question for you is, and I can actually probably refer to the point in the, the presentation that they referred to. Uh, this one was in regards to, if you remember, I think it's the um, the model you have that's basically like the, the goblin from like the kind of uh, like World of Warcraft looking goblin with the, the hammer. Oh, the... Uh, the orc here? The orc, yes, yeah, sorry. I said go. Yeah. Um, so the question <laughs> was basically related to, I notice you extrude some of the muscles, but not all. How do you make the decision which ones to extrude? Uh, let's see. Let me get the wireframe here. So like this, for example. So, I mean, there's. I don't think there's any real... Um, exact answer to that. I think it, it depends on what the application is going to be. Like if, you know, for example, if you were going to use something like this to do um, for a re like a high-end animation pipeline where you really wanted to see, you know, every single, uh, you know, muscle bulge and that sort of stuff, you'd probably have to really do a lot in the, in the, in the actual model. So like a good example would probably be um, if you think about or have ever, ever seen any of the behind the scenes stuff or wireframes from um, any of the stuff that Weta does, like if, you, if you've seen wireframes of, of anything they did on Avatar or um, I don't know if I've ever seen wireframes from um, Planet of the Apes, but a lot of their, their, their face pipeline there from what I understand is, um, you know, a lot of the face shapes that they make for any facial expression, the topology has to be there to make those to make those expressions. So you can actually move the the verts or the or the topology around to make um, you know the the the, dis, the distinct eye wrinkles or forehead wrinkling. Um, so to that level, you'd probably for a head, um, depending again depending on the application, you'd probably want to have a pretty high poly model um, to be able to make the the expressions that you want. Um, for this. Um, you know, it, it, it. I don't know if there's really a, a, an exact answer. I mean, the I do like like having. Um, I, I think it's part of my workflow is that I do like having um, a solid base mesh where things are really sort of figured out to 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 start sculpting on. I'm not. I don't typically, you know, start from a sphere. Um, I might start from a sphere at some point just to really rough something out. But there's always a point. Maybe it's just from having worked in production um, that I'm just more of like a production oriented uh, artist in that sense is that before I really do get into the sculpting I want to make sure that topology is flowing in the right directions and that the major forms are actually there instead of just having this be like a stick figure and then I just try to sculpt everything in um, right. so I think that's just part of the way I work but also part of um, probably what would be expected in uh, in a production environment if this was going to have to be animated you'd, you'd want and this again is not by any means um, final. Uh, this, for example, I mean, I could. This sort of worked for the application that I was using it for. I mean, it worked for, you know, getting him into this pose. Um, but you know, if this was actually run through an animation pipeline, and this happens all the time to me at work, where you know, um, I'll work on something, send it off to the rigger, and then he'll start playing with it and say, you know what, this this isn't working. We need more topology here or less topology. So it's kind of again an iterative process that I don't think there's any one right or wrong way to answer it, but just from my perspective, I like to have topology where the major muscle forms are. So the, the pecs are defined. I have um, topology around the bicep. Um, I have topology uh, kind of rotating um, from the from the wrist and kind of uh, rotating up as it gets up to the forearm so that you could do like a wrist rotation and the topology wouldn't get all kinked up. Um, you know, shoulders and triceps are a little bit defined here. The the traps and in, in the back and some of the leg anatomy and, and again on the front here, just kind of defining some of these lines here for where the 
sort of the obliques and the and the the abdomen kind of ties in with the with the legs. So that's just um, you know I guess it's kind of personal preference, but that's something you'd probably learn in production. You start doing work and then stuff would get shot back. You need have to maybe modify things. So um, okay. again, it's I think it's all experimentation. What kind of works for you? So the next question, um, second to last, is yep. I've noticed a lot of senior artists just using still images. Are turntables slash camera animated presentations no good anymore? Um, I think they're cool. I, I mean, but I think, you know, when, when we're looking at portfolios, I mean, there's a lot that we can get out of, um, out of, still, out of still images. I mean, there's a lot that you, can, that you can get from those. I don't, I mean, I wouldn't say that it, that, turntables or, or camera rotations are dead. I think it does help, you know, in terms of presentation, if you do some nice, uh, you know, if you do a nice camera move or something like that, instead of just like a normal sort of rotating 360, um, you can certainly, uh, it's one of those things that you can certainly save yourself time with if you don't, you know, want to do turntables. Um, I mean, obviously now with real-time renders like Marmoset or something like that, you could spit out a turntable relatively easily or, um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's one right or wrong answer to that. I, stills work fine. Um, again, it's nice with a still to just be able to kind of stop it, and you can just kind of look at this and and sort of pick it apart and and really sort of look at things. So, um, I, I wouldn't say they're dead. I think they're they do have their place. But um, either one works. I don't think there's really um, a right or wrong way. But I I think if you are going to do, um, I would say if you are going to do turntables or 3D camera moves, I would also add in, um, also have some stills. I wouldn't just do, um, I wouldn't just do the, the 3D, the animated stuff, also have some stills in there. So I think stills are certainly extremely important, but um, you know, whether or not you want to do 3D camera moves or turntables is kind of up to you, but if you are going to do 3D stuff, definitely have some stills in there. Okay, and one more before the last question, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, could you briefly talk about your process for finding design inspiration for your personal work? Ooh, uh, it's not really, a loaded it's just, question. It's, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's really just cruising around um, different sites. I mean, I'll find, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I mean, the, the, the design stuff for some of this, like this, the, the Blizzard contest, it kind of had to fit in with the, with that World of Warcraft um, universe, so that was a little bit easier in the sense that that um, you know there's some there's some Blizzard art books that I was able to look at and find. They had sketches and all that sort of stuff, so I was able to find uh, design inspiration from that sort of stuff. Um, I think for the interesting thing about this image here is I was actually watching the History Channel one day and I saw this. They were there was something on Lincoln and I saw um, this dude's you know they, they were talking about Seward here. And I saw his face. I was like, God, that guy's pretty interesting looking. I'm going to look him up and see kind of what his face looks like. So there's times where I'm specifically looking for stuff, but then there's also other times where something like totally random, I'll be out somewhere, I'll be watching something, and something will, I'll see something like this and be like, oh, that kind of serves as an inspiration. So um, it'll kind of it'll get me from different angles. That, you know, Sometimes it'll happen when I least expect it. Um, then there's also... You know, for example, this guy, this was more of like a, essentially like a pipeline for creating a digital double where um, it's, you know, from the movie and a lot of that stuff has been worked out. I think one of the important things is to kind of figure out what it is that, that you actually want to do because working in a production environment like on a Call of Duty, we have concept artists and designers who are doing, and that's their sole task, so they do a lot of that work. Um, and then that gets kind of trickled over to the character team, and we're responsible for building that. So one thing I would say is if you're not the strongest designer or you're not super confident with your design skills, then maybe take these examples like what I've done here is, is find stuff that's been solidly designed and execute on it and, and not, don't necessarily worry about the design aspects really just work on executing what the design actually is because a lot of times we'll see even in portfolios we'll see work that might be technically well done but if the design isn't good then it's kind of like well I mean you did all that work but the design itself wasn't all that strong so it kind of brings the work that you did down a little bit so I think it's really a matter of figuring out what it is you want to do and what it is you're good at if you're not a designer then then you know don't design just take something um, that that you can uh, riff on and, and kind of execute something like that. So 
but if you do want to design stuff, I, I kind of you know look around different websites and and um, movies and that sort of stuff. I mean, inspiration can come from anywhere, and it's usually finding something that I'm kind of interested in. So, you know, for this character here, it was just some sort of um, I think I was looking at um, deep sea fish. So he's kind of got um, a little bit of a little bit of a, a, a fish feel to the front of the face, and, and I was kind of inspired to do some sort of alien creation. So I was like, well, what if I mix a little bit of like deep sea uh, creatures with a sort of biped alien type thing? And so that's kind of where where this sort of came from. So um, I don't consider myself the strongest uh, straight up designer. So I kind of you know, dial myself into a smaller area and say, you know, I'm going to focus on something that's maybe alien with a little bit of uh, like deep sea fish thing mixed in and kind of go on that instead of just leaving the canvas completely open to being like, I'm just going to design a whole bunch of different aliens, like, because that's not really my forte is, is coming up with that stuff. So that's what I'd say. I'd say if you're not, you know, necessarily a designer, then, you know, stick with doing the character art and find designs that are already done and, and execute on those. Okay, and our last question to wrap up today's uh, interview with the Masters uh, is, right. were there any things you found invaluable to have learned on the job that you may not have experienced uh, going to a, a Nomen or Trinity, basically? Ooh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I think, I think stuff that I've learned on the job is just general, like, production workflows like we're always under deadline and stuff just has to get done and so you know with my personal work sometimes my personal projects will take me like it seems like they just take me longer and longer now like they used to be like a few you know a few weeks now it's like months sometimes I'll have personal projects going for years now um, but having more you know working in in a production environment where you have to get stuff done is just a lot I've learned a lot of little workarounds and, and hacks to get things done like so for example um, like what I was mentioning before, let me go back to say this image here, some of the Call of Duty stuff. So, you know, typically I think the thing that you might gather from from um, a school or that you wouldn't necessarily learn unless you were in production is that you may think that um, this character is with the way the current trends are going and a lot of information out there is that, you know, you know, focus solely on your high poly, make sure that's completely locked in make that thing really nice and then worry later on about your low poly. Um, we've really found like almost the opposite that we kind of have to make sure that everything sort of works properly in the low poly and that technically for the pipeline it's all worked out so that we know exactly what pieces are being shared with different characters. We make sure all that stuff's locked in before actually committing to, to the time of going on to the high poly and detailing everything. So. Um, most of my workflow now is really building things in Maya, making sure everything is sort of locked in before, you know, getting into that high poly phase. So I think that's one of the things that I've learned um, from working in production is that, at least for production, if you were doing personal work, that that's obviously a completely different um, scenario. If you're just making this one character, sure, you could go and just worry about the high poly. But I've also found from for speeding myself up is that if I build a, a kind of low poly or sort of medium polygon mesh in my and make sure everything's um, is accounted for so like for example if I was building this character I'd do like a medium resolution mesh on the gloves the pants the boots all that stuff and then from there it would get UV and then um, and then I from there I could send that out to my uh, to mudbox or ZBrush do the sculpting work and then I actually don't have to go through the whole phase of fully resurfacing it because I already have a mesh that's kind of medium to low poly, I can just decimate that or use that low poly as my baking mesh and that kind of has saved us a lot of time as opposed to just going into, into ZBrush and using DynaMesh and starting with spheres and just sculpting out everything then and there and then have to go back and do all of your uh, retopology later. So that's been a, a real time saver is that we kind of build all of our stuff and then send it out for detailing. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things I've learned from, from working in production is just kind of finding ways to work a little bit smarter and a little bit quicker. Awesome. Well, Pete, thank you so much for a wonderful interview with the master cool. session. Um, everyone yes, in attendance, I thank you all for participating. Um, for those of you who are asking when does Pete teach his class, basically his class will be running after the character casting class um, in the middle of the, uh, the program next year. 
So for those of you who are taking the Character Arts program, uh, Pete will be joining us next year um, right after the Character Casting class. He'll be heading yep. up to Character Creation 1 class in our program. So uh, for those of you interested, please look out for that and, and don't hesitate to sign up for the program next year. Um, beyond that, again, thank you all for attending today's live interview with the Master Session and for Pete Zoppy, basically our senior character artist from Treyarch who just gave us an, an amazing presentation. Uh, again, Pete, thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. Awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend, guys. Take care. All right.